Um, so my theme today is um, that of a kaleidoscope, something that's constantly changing. Uh, and I have two meanings in mind um, when I talk about the uh, Black Atlantic as a kaleidoscope. First, the Black Atlantic was not uniform. Uh, the black experience in this vast space was hardly the same. It was not a one piece. Uh, there were enormous variations throughout the, uh, the Atlantic world. So rather than one, there were many Black Atlantics. So in a sense, my title is somewhat m mistitled. Um, so I want to reveal then in this, in this, in this talk um, something of the many differences, the constant variations. Uh, it's also kaleidoscopic because I'm going to show you, as I mentioned, an array of images of the black experience to indicate that it's possible to reveal graphically uh, significant aspects of black life. Many, though not all, of these images come from the, uh, from the Atlantic slave trade and slave life in the Americas website. Um, so you can easily put together your own version of what I'm about to show you to some degree. But I've also added a lot that I've accumulated over the years myself. Um, so while I'm committed to showing you variations then and constant changes, there was obviously some core experiences in the black Atlantic. Those blacks who were slaves shared an, an, an enviable status because slaves, uh, slavery always meant uh, selling human beings as alienable property. But to be a slave in Africa, uh, was a very different matter, as we know, from being a slave in the Americas. In most places in Africa, at least in the 16th and 17th centuries, uh, slavery was a marginal institution, a minor, inst a mi a minor uh, feature of the social landscape. Many a slave was able to pass over time uh, from an alien member to a, to a kin member. In large part because Africa was underpopulated, there was a broad spectrum of dependent statuses in Africa, with slavery just one variant of a whole array of, of uh, statuses from clientage, pawnage, and so on. Uh, and slaves played a wide range of roles in Africa, from field workers to uh, soldiers, uh, from domestics, uh, even to high-level bureaucrats and administrators. Uh, and I'm going to show you a picture here of a, uh, a well-armed African uh, this is a very early 17th century portrait of a, of a black man from Angola. Or the, uh, I could show you, uh, sh here we go, sorry, uh, this uh, Gold Coast African, a free ranger, uh, so-called, in Suriname in the late 18th century, uh, obviously well-armed, but in this case uh, with a musket. Another core experience uh, was the sugar plantation uh, that we talked about yesterday that drew so many Africans um, to, to the New World. There was a measure of uniformity to, being, to, be, to living on a sugar plantation, so no matter where it was located. Uh, as early as the 1630s, a visitor to a Jesuit-owned sugar plantation in Brazil vividly described the undeniable horror of what had transpired. And this is what he said, people the color of the very night, working briskly and moaning at the same time without a moment of peace or rest, Whoever sees all the confused and noisy machinery and apparatus of this Babylon, even if they have seen Mount Etna and Vesuvius, they will say this is indeed the image of hell. And you get a sense, I think, from this uh, Caribbean depiction of the nightmarish quality of uh, working uh, at night in a boiling house with slaves hauling cane trash uh, to the fuel furnace. But not all sugar plantations were of a piece. Most Brazilian sugar, sugar planters, for example, at least posed as patriarchs. This is something uh, you remember David Brian Davis talks about. Whereas many Caribbean planters made little effort to conceal that they were entrepreneurs whose goal in life was to make money, uh, not to become resident seigneurs. So a good many West Indian sugar planters were absentees, whether back in France or Britain or the Netherlands. They tended to see themselves as engaged in a purely capitalistic enterprise not a quasi-senioral community, as did many Brazilian planters, who adopted something of the style of feudal lords. And you get a sense of that, I think, from this, uh, this Brazilian scene. It's um, about 1640. Uh, you see the manor house in the background. You see the plantation buildings. You see the vertical, uh, sugar, uh, ro uh, vertical roller sugar mill. And in the center of the scene, you see the planter riding on his horse uh, uh, ahead of his, uh, I think it must be probably his wife or his concubine, who's being transported in a hammock. So we have these traditions of uh, paternalistic patronage, 
uh, that, you know, that existed amongst the Brazilian slaveholders doesn't mean that they were kinder uh, and gentler than their more capitalistic slaveholders in the Caribbean, but their exploitation did occur, I think, in the context of, you know, where they use metaphors of family, obligation, and clientage. And there's a different sort of quality, I think, to the style of life uh, between sugar plantation life in Brazil and that in the Caribbean. So if you turn to Caribbean scenes, and uh, you know, I know I've shown this one before of cane holding, you don't see a white person in sight. Uh, this is um, a black driver uh, running the show. Uh, similarly, uh, another scene of uh, planting cane uh, uh, in, uh, in Antigua. Again, uh, no white person in, pre in, in, in evidence. Um, uh, here's, a, here's, here's a group cutting uh, cane. Note the prominence of women uh, in this grueling task on a sugar plantation, something I emphasized. Um, here we actually do see, I think, uh, no we don't because it's off image, but there is actually an overseer there, but again you see a black driver uh, running the show. You see the women stacking the cane uh, uh, on, you know, in, the, in the foreground and you see them carrying the cane on their heads into the mill. So even a core experience such as the sugar plantation has variations is my point. A third core experience was just living along the Atlantic African coast or its adjoining hinterlands. Quite how many people that involved is extremely hard to say, but maybe approximately 25 million people or more lived on the Atlantic African coast. So if you're looking for the majority black experience in the Atlantic, it would be there, wouldn't it? Some of these Africans were active and voluntary participants in the Atlantic world. Even though the Atlantic coast of tropical Africa had been more isolated than regions closer to the Sahara or along the Indian Ocean, until the arrival of the Portuguese, West African societies had developed marketing networks, professional merchants, systems of transport and currencies through participation in local and regional trade. So, in a sense, the transatlantic slave trade uh, could simply, uh, you know, uh, impose itself on an already existing, well-developed market structure. And here we see captive Africans whipped and guarded by other Africans, their, their captors. Uh, this is a, a, an 18th century image from, the, uh, from the, uh, the Gold Coast. Here is, a cap here is the capture and coffle of an enslaved Africans in Angola in the 1780s. You see that some of the traders have guns. Uh, some of the coffles are more restrained uh, than others. Some are, uh, you know, cl clearly you, you always restrain the men. This is an image uh, dr uh, that a slave ship captain um, uh, uh, did in, in, in Sierra Leone in the 17, uh, early 1790s. You see Fulani guards armed with bows, arrows, and spears escorting a coffle that uh, had, he, he said in his journal, 50 people or more. African rulers and merchants control much of the nature of interactions with Europeans. Some of them allowed Europeans to set up forts and factories uh, on sufferance along the coast. There the Europeans paid rent and tribute and taxes to African landlords. This was most evident along the Gold Coast uh, where there were few accessible rivers and there was strong surf. So here's a picture of Elmina Castle on the Gold Coast. I know some of you have been there. This is a 1640 image of what it was like. Uh, it clearly quite changes quite a bit over time. Um, Christiansborg Castle uh, also uh, in the early 18th century here on the Gold Coast. Uh, you can see the north and east sides of the fort and you see the neighboring African town that always uh, you know, is, is present before the fort is built but then grows larger by the side of it. Da Christianburg Castle was built by the Danes around about 1660. So that's uh, one pattern uh, uh, but other Africans didn't allow Europeans to erect substantial shore facilities on their coasts. Uh, so trade was largely conducted on ship or uh, in, on inshore sort of trading shanties. Uh, this was the pattern in the Bight of Biafra. Um, I'm, I'll give you, I'll refresh you about where these places are I'm referring to, but I think you've already got a sense of that, where ships went up the Niger Delta uh, to trade. There were no forts there at all. You've got these large canoes bringing large numbers of slaves uh, to the ship. This is a Portu Portuguese brig in the River Bonny uh, around about uh, uh, 1800. So 
so, you, so this is another picture of the, another portrait of the river. This is actually in the era of palm oil, just, just after, after the abolition of the slave trade. But again, I think you can see, uh, the reason I showed it is you can see these canoes uh, uh, serving those ships that will, uh, that can, can, these ocean-going ships that can navigate quite a way up the, up the, up the Bonnie River. Uh, uh, canoes also battled really heavy surf. Anybody who's been to uh, the West African coast knows uh, extremely heavy surf, uh, and uh, uh, so, you know, no point, uh, you know, the, the, they had to have canoes that would uh, negotiate uh, extremely rough seas. Uh, this is thought to be uh, Senegambia, uh, by the way. So along certain parts of the coast, Africans were skilled at battling the surf and canoeing out to vessels. Other took, others took advantage of inland waterways, lagoons, uh, and there the canoes uh, tended uh, to be bigger. Um, You'll see, I mean, from the 17th century, you can see, and this is a Gold Coast uh, image, you can see that, yes, uh, they did use canoes to take out slaves to ship smaller numbers in terms of the Gold Coast just because they had to battle uh, that surf. Much, fis much fishing was done around uh, slave vessels. I mean, you can see the sort of, the sort of scale of it from, from that image. Um, a naval lieutenant um, who, uh, who, who traversed the... Um, the, the West African coast. I found this image in the National Maritime Museum. It's a wonderful set of watercolors by this man, Gabriel Bray. Um, I think this is Gold Coast, and you can see he's quite taken with the kind of vigor with which these uh, three uh, slave canoemen, um, as I say, probably along the Gold Coast are, are forging on a pretty small uh, canoe. Or you've got, um, you know, large canoes going up the rivers, like this Ebo canoe here. Uh, uh, got a platform even on the middle of the vessel. Uh, or we have, here we, here's another image of Bray because there were certain African, African, Africans who became very skilled mariners and began to work on transatlantic ships. And this is, a, again, Gabriel Bray's image of, we think, three uh, crewmen, uh, K-R-U, uh, uh, crewmen, uh, a group, an ethnic group that became very skilled at, uh, at uh, and worked on many transatlantic uh, ships. Uh, so these are African sailors uh, using European tools. They appear to be pounding uh, nuts. Um, uh, and here is a, here is a testimonial um, from one crewman, uh, Ben Freeman, um, uh, born at Crew Cetra, uh, uh, so this is his uh, ivory horn as a kind of testimonial to indicate that he had served well on a on a Her Majesty's ship Tice, and uh, he had sailed from Sierra Leone to Ambrise. Ambrise is just north of uh, just north of Luanda in Angola, uh, and uh, so he'd had that horn decorated to be his, his kind of testimonial letter, as it were. African sellers of slaves entered into a partnership with European shippers at the, expense of, at the expense of the African masses. African groups and governments were involved in the capture of other Africans, although notions of African unity, I think, were completely alien at this time. No African thought he was enslaving another African. He was not enslaving his brother. He was in, usually enslaving his enemy. Uh, along the African coast, as this pattern implies, there were great variations. Some Africans sold slaves at ports, others from ship side, as I've indicated. Some Africans cooperated with Europeans, others did not. Some regions resisted the Europeans more strongly than others. Uh, some sold more women and children uh, than others. There was no uniform pattern along the African coast then. You might ask, why did Europeans not colonize parts of Africa in this period? Why didn't they establish plantations along the coast instead of thousands of miles away and then have to pay the costs of uh, shipping their labor there? It's a good question. Uh, and I, I, I'm not sure we know completely the answer, but I mean, two things immediately jump to mind. One is the disease factor. Europeans introduced no new diseases to the West African coast. So Atlantic Africa did not experience the demographic collapse uh, that was suffered by inhabitants of the Americas. While tropical diseases remained a formidable barrier to European penetration of much of sub-Saharan Africa. So when people, when Europeans went to the West African coast, essentially nine out of 10 would die in a very rapid period indeed. It's only when quinine came into common use against malaria in the middle of the 19th century that West Africa ceased to be the white man's uh, grave. So that's one reason. Uh, the other obvious one 
is that um, uh, even when Europeans uh, were willing to endure the, you know, the, the, uh, the appalling losses of life, uh, the conquest of tropical Africa even then would have been extreme, extremely difficult. African societies possessed uh, formidable fighting skills and weaponry. These impediments and West Africa's ability and eagerness to engage in uh, Atlantic exchanges also made peaceful commerce a sounder policy. There's little, there's little reason to see West Africans' commercial re <coughs> relations with the Atlantic as weak or coerced. Generally, historians uh, argue that nowadays that Africans participated in the Atlantic trade uh, rather willingly and, for, and from a position of strength. Uh, they suggest that the trading relationship between coastal Africans and Europeans needs to be viewed as a partnership. As one historian puts it, the slave trade was a symptom of African strength. Uh, not weakness. No one argues that those shipped in chains from Africa can be counted as anything other than victims, uh, though their powerlessness in shaping the new world events is no longer assumed. Whether one considers the African rulers and merchants who grew rich from the trade as successful entrepreneurs or as class exploiters, uh, I think depends on your, your perspective, and we could talk about that. But certainly the volume and tr value of Atlantic trade increased enormously from the, from, the 17th, from the 16th through the 18th centuries. And the terms of trade shifted very sharply in the African traders' favor, by the way, uh, particularly over the course of the 18th century. So by one, one calculation, a slave cost a European twice as much at the end of the 18th century <coughs> as it did <coughs> at the beginning. The Middle Passage, much as it was mind-numbingly barbaric uh, and, you know, and therefore uniform in, all, you know, in some <coughs> aspects, also varied greatly uh, from place to place. I've already mentioned that one major variation was the sex and age of the captives. And I'm just going to re you know, remind you of those regions again, and I'll just mention them um, without... Can I get rid of that thing? I can't, can I? Sorry. Um, Senegambia, uh, which is the northernmost region, which you can see with that little icon on it, um, uh, that, that place um, sold, on average, 6% uh, uh, children. 6% of, uh, of their voyages contained children. Much smaller proportion uh, than was the norm, as I mentioned. Whereas West Central Africa, the most southern part, the most southernmost region of Africa, that they're trading with, in, for the most part. There, the proportion of children in most voyages was like 20%. So it was enormous variation then in the proportion you might find on any, on any vessel of, of children. Uh, Senegambia was the, 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 the lowest, and West Central Africa was the, uh, the highest. Um, if you went to the Bight of Biafra, which is uh, you know, in, the, in, in, the, in the horn, the, 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 the corner there um, of, the, of the horn, um, there, there uh, as many women as men uh, were sold in most, in most slave vessels, roughly equal numbers of women and men. But as we know, in most other places, men out women, outnumbered women at least you know, by some proportion, sometimes quite markedly, but, but, uh, but, um, but nothing as equal as the Bight of Biafra. So there were all sorts of variations just in types of the types of captives you would find on any slave ship. And David Eltis will talk more about this this afternoon. Uh, why was this? Uh, why, we, I don't think we absolutely know, but we've got some theories. One factor is simply the distance that the captives are being brought to the coast. So the further you brought people from, to the coast, it's argued there's more of a premium on uh, men and the avoidance of children. Because when the force marches long, you, you know, you, you've got a sense that you're, you, you might lose women and children. And also it's expensive, and so you want the most prime... Uh, the prime captives to, to, to take to the coast. That's one reason. Another reason is um, if a region is involved heavily in the Trans-Saharan slave trade, which involved, which involved heavy numbers of women, then, um, then that might make women less readily available to the transatlantic slave trade. So some for some places, like Senegambia, that's heavily involved in transatlantic, because it's so northerly, and is in, has an extensive... Uh, trade going across the Sahara going north, um, they, uh, they would have less women to sell uh, uh, to, to the uh, 
to the Europeans. Uh, one last reason might be women were always agricultural workers in Africa, but in some places heavy work was reserved for men, so such regions might be willing to sell off more women uh, than uh, usual. On the, on the slave ship, um, you know, you, you, you find a, a, a marked division uh, uh, between men and women. Uh, you see this barricade that's running uh, down, the, down the ship and you can see on one side the women uh, and on the one side the men. The men are to the right, the women are to the left. The women are preparing food here and the food is being passed uh, through an through a, uh, access window uh, to the males. This is an early 19th century uh, top deck of a French slaver. It's a very unusual image. It's one of the rare ones we have of what that relationship was like. So you see a close relationship of white sailors and black women depicted here. Uh, uh, that's uh, important, I think. Uh, uh, the fact that most slavers did not shackle women, uh, but only shackled the men, uh, may help explain why um, on transatlantic vessels, the pattern that's emerged is that you find more resistance on ships that have more women uh, than usual. So when you find a high proportion of women on a slave ship, it's more likely there's going to be a revolt on it. Why, why would that be? The, question, the, the answer, I think, is that the women are unshackled, as I've said. Uh, they have closer relationships with the white sailors. They've got access to keys. Uh, they know where the weapons are stashed. Uh, and uh, that may be the reason. So revolts weren't constant either then. They've, they varied according to the mix uh, of, uh, of men and women on board ship and they varied according to the region from which Africans came because revolts happened far more from vessels leaving places like Senegambia and the Windward Coast <coughs> than from those leaving, say, from the Gold Coast and from the Bight of Biafra. And it's thought that might be, have a lot to do with the presence of ex-soldiers who were often present on uh, Upper Guinea uh, slave ships. I have a slide of a, of a slave revolt on a ship. You can see uh, the, the sailors on the, on the stern of the ship um, firing at slaves in the, in the, uh, in the up open decks. And you can see some slaves committing suicide by diving into the, into the sea. Mortality also varied from one African region to another, uh, even from ports within the same region. The disease environments of particular hinterlands appears to be the key variable. Ships from the Bight of Biafra suffered the worst mortality, those from West Central Africa the least. That most slaves came out of West Central Africa then, I think you could say, has an obvious explanation. That's, there was less mortality from that region. Uh, So-called tight packing, the cramming of slaves into already overcrowded holes, something that the abolitionists highlighted as one of the great crimes of the slave trade, actually seems to have had little impact on mortality. All slave ships were crowded uh, and it was far more important what the disease environment from which they came, the levels of mortality uh, that they, they were experiencing in the hinterland that might explain why there was more deaths on some slave ships than others. That's what now people are arguing. Get a sense of that overcrowding. It's very, we have very few images of what it was like below deck in a slave ship. Uh, this is an early 19th century depiction of below decks on a Brazilian slaver. Uh, you know, how accurate that depiction is has been questioned, uh, but there we have it. Uh, this is my, my favorite, actually. I think it gives you the best sense of what it might have been like. Uh, this is a lieutenant serving on a British naval ship. They're engaged in anti-slaving operations um, in the, off the African coast. This is in, the, uh, you know, in 18, uh, 1845, and he shows what it was, what it was like below deck on a uh, Portuguese uh, ship. So variations then in the Middle Passage, and I've just given you a couple of examples of age and sex of captives and of, um, and of uh, um, resistance. Um, once we move across the Atlantic, the variations only multiply. Uh, there are some obvious differences over time and space that existed uh, that I'm going uh, to explore. First, there was a great difference between, you know, in, in places where slave populations grew naturally that were self-reproducing, and places where the slave population grew only because they imported more newcomers. So there was a great deal of variation, and that was a key one, I think, uh, in the experience of slavery outside Africa. One population would have, uh, uh, eventually have a majority of native-born uh, people among it, uh, 
the other would always have a large number of newcomers among it. In broad terms, uh, as I'm sure you know, the North American slave population is very distinctive because it became one of the few self-reproducing slave populations in world history. So the fact that in North America you got a rapid and uh, early a natural increase, birth succeeding deaths among the slave population, explains why North America received a very small percentage of the overall transatlantic slave trade, about 4%, that's all. Um, but even there, within North America, there was a considerable variation. So the Chesapeake region, the region we're in now, Maryland and Virginia, had a naturally growing slave population as early as the beginning of the 18th century. Uh, the lower south of South Carolina and Georgia, much later, uh, not really till toward the end of the, to, 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 toward the middle of the century, toward the revolution. Some island populations where sugar wasn't grown, uh, you know, you see, we often say there's no self-reproduction in the Caribbean, not true. Uh, places like uh, the Bahamas, for example, had self-reproducing slave populations by the early to mid 18th century. Even the slave population of Barbados, uh, the dominant, you know, a very dominant sugar society, but by the late 18th century it was no longer as dominant a sugar society as it had once been, and there the slaves were beginning to reproduce naturally. In other words, the slave population was beginning to grow just, uh, you know, faintly, but it was growing more by births than deaths, and they were importing uh, fewer, very, very few Africans actually by that point. In most of Brazil, much of the Caribbean, there was no positive natural growth rate. And that explains why those two regions received the bulk of the Africans who came to the Americas. Their slave populations in general increased only because of coerced migration then. Deaths exceeded births among the slaves in those two regions and they just, they were never able to have populations for the most part. There were parts of Brazil that also did this, but uh, we can get into that also if you like. Another, ma another major variation, and I'm sure you're also familiar with this one, that helps uh, describe different types of experiences across the Atlantic world. There are societies that we call true slave societies, and there are societies that just we call society, slave-owning societies, or societies that just have some slaves in them. And there's a great variation there, and, it's a, and it explains a lot about uh, the, the, the variant experience that one, one will find. Uh, in the one case then, slavery is the determinative institution and in the other it's incidental. Um, and clearly the, the black experience is going to be very different in those two places. Let's just explore some of the places where slavery was marginal to begin with. Most European societies fit that bill. So from the 1440s onward, the Portuguese began importing black, black Africans into Lisbon and other Iberian ports via the Atlantic. Still, in the 15th and 16th centuries, North African and Muslim slaves exceeded black slaves in Iberia. Nevertheless, by the early 17th century, black slaves numbered about 15,000, or 15%, 15 say, of Lisbon's population uh, at that point. A significant number, but a, a, a small minority. You can get a sense, I think, uh, of what um, of what black life in Lisbon was like from this very, very I mean, a fantastic image, a waterfront district in Lisbon. Uh, this image is in the 1570s. Uh, it's a wharf scene. Uh, a king's fountain uh, is, uh, is present in the right-hand side. Uh, we see, you know, black, lots of blacks uh, in this. I mean, scores of blacks in that picture. I, I must try to count them all. There, there, there's, there's certainly very many. Uh, there are water bearers uh, working at the fountain to private servants in livery doing their daily uh, errands. And I'm going to show you some details just so you can get a sort of uh, a sense of what's going on here, some, some, some close-ups that will give you a, a better sense of some of the variation uh, he, even here. Uh, here we have uh, and perhaps, and these are open to interpretation, but might be a man being arrested, a black man being arrested and being led away by two constables. Uh, they wear distinctive red hats, as you can see, with white feathers. Uh, they've got the uh, gold badge of office on their, uh, on their left-hand sleeve, and they appear to be dragging off this apprehensive and unwilling uh, black man, and you can see the woman looking rather fearful to his right. So, you know, an undercurrent of violence uh, may, maybe could be interpreted uh, into what this would be like. But on the other hand, we have this uh, African, uh, or uh, maybe, uh, maybe Creole, uh, 
uh, uh, black um, dancing, seemingly dancing, uh, with a white woman. So there's a degree of fraternization uh, that's rather interesting. We have that image, if you remember from the, if you go back, and just see so that to the right there, that man on a horse, well here he is in close-up. Um, he, uh, he's a free black, one assumes, I think, uh, uh, mounted on a horse, wearing a cape, bearing the red cross of the Order of Santiago. Uh, so some freed slaves reached prominent social positions, especially in slave-owning societies, uh, as this was. All those pictures, all those images, are lots of images of uh, carrying water vessels on heads. Um, uh, quite what the uh, uh, quite what the significance of the prominent role given to the broken vessel over the man's head, uh, with its contents spilling over him. I, I'm not quite sure. It's a very prominent place in the picture. Uh, I've never seen any art historian tell me what, uh, it, unless it's meant to just be, com com you know, humorous, uh, which it may well be. And then one last detail from this picture. Um, it's right at the very front. Uh, it shows a black oarsman to the left. Uh, it shows a boat with a white couple. Looks as though the man is I mean, maybe perhaps about to kiss the woman, I don't know, uh, and being serenaded by the black musician in red with his uh, tambourine. So blacks certainly were present in, um, in Portugal from a very early period, quite numerous, but uh, always a small minority living in a slave-owning society. Blacks could be found in Britain in this period. In the early 16th century, English merchants began trading along the African coast. And in 1555, perhaps the first group of black Africans arrived in England. That's, what the, the, that's the date. Um, in 17th century London, blacks became everyday sites. And by the middle of the 18th century, the city contained about 10,000 blacks about 2% uh, of the capital's total population, very small percentage. Uh, and you could always find blacks around the countryside uh, in Britain in the 18th century. I'm going to so show you a sketch of the slave trader John Hawkins Crest. Uh, it's late 16th century, shows, his, uh, shows the armlets uh, around that uh, African person to indicate slave status. That's what those armlets signified on his uh, crest of arms. Um, here's a very famous study of a black man by Sir Joshua Reynolds about 1770. Uh, this is a noble, uh, almost uh, epic figure, you could say, silhouetted, silhouetted against a, a dramatic sky. Um, this is widely considered to be a portrait of Francis Barber, uh, who uh, was Samuel Johnson, the famous lexicographer's servant. Uh, Barber was born enslaved on Jamaica uh, sometime around 1745. He was brought to England by his master. When the master died in 1754, Barber was given his freedom, uh, and he joined Dr. Johnson's, Dr. Johnson's household. Uh, he worked for an apothecary for a while. He, he went into the Royal Navy for a while. Uh, but for the most part, he remained in Johnson's service until the man's death in, till, in 1784. And I think, you know, this, this shows an image uh, of, a, of a black person revealed in all his sort of remarkable uh, individuality. Or we have, you know, John Singleton Copley, the famous American painter, but who's working in London at the time. Here is his head of a Negro, as it's titled, circa 1777. Uh, so here we have a portrait of a black man with a frank gaze, an engaging smile, uh, painted in London. Could be a favorite slave in his household. We just don't know. We think that's a possibility. And he's clearly the model for the black sailor who uh, dominates the physical center of Copley's famous uh, Watson and the Shark of 1778. That, that's, there's a number of, it, there's a number of uh, versions of this painting, but if you have time and you're in the National Gallery down in DC, you, you, can, you can see it. Uh, it's one of the best 18th century sea paintings, I think, we have. Uh, and it's inspired by a real event that took place in Havana, Cuba uh, in 1749. Fourteen-year-old uh, Brooke uh, Watson, uh, uh, who served as a crew member on a trading ship, was attacked by a shark uh, while he was swimming. Uh, an unusual event for a sailor, obviously, obviously uh, following Ben Franklin's advice, uh, and, uh, and got attacked by a shark. So his shipmates uh, launched this valiant rescue effort, uh, and they were successful. We don't know this from the painting, but people would have known that uh, Watson did, w was saved by his, um, by his, uh, by his valiant sail uh, sailor crew, uh, crewmates. Uh, and he was seen stumping around London on a prosthetic leg uh, thereafter. 
The reason why, just one sidelight, why are English ships in Havana, Cuba, uh, in 1749, because the, was the British had actually get, regained the asiento uh, from the Spanish, the legal contract to supply the Spanish colonies with African slaves, and uh, so they, that, that ship was undoubtedly engaging in slaving. And, but we have an African, you know, or maybe a native-born uh, African-American, perhaps, uh, a crew member here. Um, I just show you a close-up of him there, so you get a good a good sense of me. I mean, he's clearly the same same man. Um, there he is. Is he free? Is he a slave? Uh, good question. We we don't know the answer. Um, here is a here is a, a portrait uh, done by an, a, a fairly unknown uh, English artist, Thomas Downman. But we do know who this man is. He is Thomas Williams. Um, he was a sailor. Uh, uh, he worked out of Liverpool. Who worked out of Liverpool? Uh, note the earrings. Uh, note the neckerchief. Uh, note the supplicant posture, uh, perhaps meant to indicate the abolitionist sympathies of the painter. Uh, this, was a, in, this, this was done in the early 19th century. We have other figures stumping around London, like uh, Billy Waters, famous busker. Uh, who also was a former sailor. Lots of images of him. I'm just going to show you two or three, maybe four. Here he is. And here he is. Um, or Joseph Johnson, a famous beggar on the London streets who sported a model of the ship Nelson, uh, invoking the famous admirable on his head. So he would go around trying to drum up uh, a, little, a little charity from, his, uh, from the people passing by. All we have, I've just recently found these, uh, been sent to me by the Tasmanian Art Museum. Who would have thought there would be images of blacks in London or in Britain um, in Tasmania? But they recently showed up in a Tasmanian Art Museum. This is a vivid watercolor of a man known as Black Charlie, who was a bootmaker who lived in Norwich uh, in East Anglia in England in the early 19th century. Uh, uh, this is, a, no, uh, he, nobody knew much about this. Uh, painter, John Dempsey, uh, but we have these very unsentimental, rather realistic, uh, almost documentary uh, uh, depictions of, uh, of uh, Africans. There's, there's a number of them. I'm just going to show you a couple. Here's another of a, of a, of a sweeper. So black, black slaves then were regularly bought and sold in European cities and served in all sorts of menial capacities. Uh, we've got black slaves carrying uh, wine skins in uh, Castile, Spain as early as the 1520s. Uh, note the ankle chain uh, there. Or we've got a black slave in the household of a wealthy uh, patrician. This is the early 16th century uh, also. Uh, domestic, a domestic scene then. We can see the slave serving the family uh, at table. Yet particularly in northern Europe where, bond, where freedom, not bondage, was the norm, Slaves were emboldened to throw off the yoke of thrall thraldom. Gradually grew up the belief that slavery was suspended, though not all was extinguished, by moving to Europe. So, for example, there's a good study of what happened in France uh, 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 over the course of the 18th century. Uh, many slaves could gain their freedom in French courts by arguing that there was free air in uh, European soil. Or, of course, we know the very famous case in England in 1772, the famous Somerset case, uh, where blacks could secure, uh, not exactly secure their freedom, but made it much more difficult for a master. The ruling was that a master could not, not forcibly remove a black slave from England. Uh, and so the most serious threat to slaves was thereby removed, and slavery was gradually put on the, put on the, uh, on the uh, it wasn't eventually abolished, obviously, in England until 1833, but uh, it began to decline in, in importance uh, from that ruling uh, onwards. It was as if slavery had been abolished, because if, if a slave owner couldn't take his slave away, uh, then obviously uh, that, that was a huge penalty, as many West Indian slaveholders uh, argued. By custom, if not law, many blacks in European towns already occupied a position intermediary, uh, intermediate between chattel slavery and the domestic service of white servants. The vast majority were servants, working as pages and valets and footmen and coachmen and cooks and maids. Uh, I show you one image here of a black servant protecting, uh, protecting his uh, mistress by keeping the red parasol in place. Parasol holding black servants 
protecting their uh, masters and mistresses from the sun was, uh, was a common image and a sign of the status of the, of the, of the, uh, of the owner. Uh, a slave was a symbol of prestige. Uh, an index of rank, something uh, Joe Becton mentioned yesterday, he's quite right. Particularly in a, in a slave-owning context, I think, particularly in a European context, uh, because they were so exotic. Uh, they were an ornament. Uh, they were a fashionable appendage. Uh, as exotica, uh, the blacker the slave, the better, actually, in a, in a, in a European context. So that's, you find, actually, a very interesting reversal of the prevailing color consciousness throughout the Atlantic world. We know that in the Americas, it's um, generally speaking more, more prestigious to be of light skin. A lighter skinned mulatto, as it, would, as it were, would often be in a household position. In Europe, uh, generally, uh, it's the blacker, the better. Uh, uh, interesting it's interesting counter, uh, counter, countervailing uh, imperative. Other examples of societies with slaves or slave-owning societies uh, uh, can be found all across the Atlantic world. I focused on Lisbon and London, but I could easily have focused on New England, where black slaves were a small percentage of the population, never more than 3%, although, as I mentioned, in some places uh, the proportion could be much higher. Uh, as in Europe, slavery's marginality permitted a narrowing of the chasm between bondage and freedom, I think, in New England. Some New England slaves sought freedom through the courts, for example, and were able to get it. Uh, black Election Day, when blacks voted for their own governors, a widespread annual festivity in New England in the 18th century, another indication of the unusual socio-political socio opportunities available in the re to the region's slaves, uh, something you, know, that, that you don't find in, uh, say, South Carolina, say. Uh, uh, most notably of all, I think, the functional unimportance of slavery within the New England economy obviously facilitated the institution's abolition during the revolutionary era. As in Europe too, many, uh, many slaves in New England were family domestics. Household slavery inevitably led to a measure of familiarity. And so, you know, wherever you are in any of the northern regions in the 18th century, you will find ads for runaway slaves as a typical New York example describing the physical characteristics of three r fugitive slaves. And notice at the very bottom, the master offering a pardon if the slaves would return voluntarily. The assumption being that this public announcement would eventually reach its way to them, rather interesting uh, in itself. Other colonies in the uh, New World were, were were societies with slaves rather than slave societies for a time. So I would say the Chesapeake, um, for example, falls into that category for much of the 17th century. And that's why in the 17th century Chesapeake you find a more fluid, flexible race relations as a result. Uh, many free blacks uh, in some counties in Virginia in the 17th century, maybe as high as a third of the black population was free. Um, uh, you know, and race relations were certainly a good deal more flexible than they would become. <coughs> So let's now look a little at uh, full-fledged slave societies. Um, uh, uh, these, uh, their race relations tended to be quite rigid. When the proportion of slaves in a society rose, say, above 50 to as many as 90% or more, or as the case in many circum-Caribbean territories, the level of repression ratcheted up. Where black slaves heavily outnumbered whites, those whites resorted to outright terror and savagery. So, so masters concocted exquisite punishments and they committed chilling acts of uh, barbarity to try to maintain control. So we have images of iron masks uh, uh, and collars uh, for, punishing, uh, for punishing slaves, much more common in slave societies than slave-owning societies, where, where, the, where the, 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 the paranoia was much greater. Similarly, uh, iron masks, neck collars, spurs, uh, leg shackles, uh, that kind of thing. Um, here we see another, you know, at the bottom there, you can see a, t uh, a, a tin collar and, a, and, a, and again, a face, a face mask. Um, these are some of the images from John Gabriel Stedman's um, uh, journal, uh, a black victim being beaten on the rack in Suriname. Uh, this is 1776. Uh, we know quite a, bit, quite a lot about that incident, uh, by the way. Uh, Similarly, um, this is a slave being gibbeted, hung up by 
uh, by, hung, hung alive by the ribs to a gallows, 1773. We have an eyewitness description of this event. Uh, the incision made in the ribs, a hook placed in the hole. Victim stayed alive for three days until clubbed to death uh, by a sentry, by a, sent a sentryman who, who this person had insulted. We've got Negro, uh, so, so this is the title of the piece, of the image, uh, a Negro female slave uh, uh, with weight tied to ankle. Uh, we have a whipping uh, going on here. Uh, uh, a female slave in Suriname in 1774 uh, noticed that, uh, that black men have whips, so they're probably drivers. Uh, she's an 18-year-old 18, uh, 18 girl who was given 200 lashes uh, for refusing to have sexual intercourse with her overseer. Oh, we have uh, the whipping of an enslaved man here in Brazil in the late 18th century. Uh, we have, here is a, an interesting portrait. Uh, this is a double portrait. On the op opposite side of this portrait is, an, is a portrait of a, of, a, of a Virginia man. But on the other side is what is the painter has given us the seamy side of life in uh, Virginia. Uh, we see violence and we also see uh, sexual exploitation. So race relations in slave societies tended to be uh, more fraught with tension, more potentially explosive than in societies that just had some slaves. So the undercurrents of fear that were always present when slaves were around uh, always lurked closer to the surface, I think, in a slave society, or very obviously. But paradoxically, where slaves formed a decisive majority, they were often able to engage in effective negotiations, testing the boundaries, say, between field and household slaves, between drivers, overseers, and the master class. Uh, so slaves sought more land for growing their own provisions, for example, in slave societies, or they sought more free time uh, from plantation labor. They sought monetary rewards for special service, and they were often able to get it, or they could run away and manage their own market exchanges. Uh, they could conduct their own burials and marriages and religious services to a greater degree, I think, than in, 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 in slave-owning societies for the most part. They might gain a surprising room uh, for maneuver then, and they often created rich, Afri rich African-inspired uh, cultures. Uh, and I'm just going to show you uh, some images of you know, cultural life in, um, in true slave societies. This is St. Vincent. Uh, in the West Indies in the 1770s. And you see a well-dressed Creole woman, uh, one clearly lightly skinned. She's not, there's not a white woman. That's a Creole woman, uh, lightly skinned. And you see the male drummer to the left. Uh, and you see a female tambourine player. I think you can see also to the left standing by the drummer. And you see the dance going on. There is a white man participating, but this is, uh, this is a largely slave-inspired event. Um, or... Uh, yet another uh, dance scene uh, on the same island. Uh, uh, There's this only blacks involved here, no white person present. Uh, Creole uh, light-skinned uh, woman there, clearly in center. But see the range of dress and undress uh, here, I think it's quite impressive. Um, or we can see a dance from Dominica in, um, in the uh, 1770s again. And note the drums and the tambourine and the hand clapping. All of those I've shown you are by uh, Augusto, Augustino Brunius, uh, who, uh, who toured through the Windward Islands uh, in the 1770s. Uh, the head ties of the women there, I think, are also particularly uh, notable. Uh, so, you know, just the sort of variety of dress is impressive. Uh, this image you will, I'm sure, have all seen. Uh, the plantation dance from the 1790s. This nice, impressive watercolor uh, uh, is, is, is thought to be a depiction of the South Carolina low country uh, in the 1790s. We've got a banjo player. Uh, we've got a percussion player. Uh, we've got somebody you know, possibly playing a, a drum or a gourd uh, to the right there. Uh, uh, there's a stick held by a man, as we can see. Uh, there are handkerchiefs. Uh, pieces of cloth uh, uh, held by the women. Uh, it's lots of explanations, interpretations of this image. Is it a marriage ceremony? Is it, is it a dance? Uh, we don't absolutely know, but, uh, but it could be 
you know, some, something like this as well. Uh, no, no, I haven't seen anybody argue this, but uh, stick fighting, uh, martial arts were um, common among uh, slaves in um, the Caribbean and in Brazil. Uh, cudgeling matches uh, between, uh, between Africans uh, happened a lot. Mar you know, as they engaging in martial arts. I said many of them were ex-soldiers. Uh, this one is from Dominica, as is that. Um, so, the drum is, uh, you see, is in, in a lots of these portraits of black dances and events and festivities. This is a Virginia drum found in Virginia in the late 17th, uh, early 18th century. It's 18 inches high, exists in the British Library. It's, it's, it's an Asante drum uh, made from African woods. Uh, it was presumably transported on a slave ship from Africa and arrived in Virginia and ended up in Sloan's uh, collection that became the basis of the British Museum. Or we can find various percussion uh, images, stringed and wind instruments uh, from Suriname, again from John Gabriel Stedman, and some of those actually have survived in, uh, and exist in, in, in Holland now. Uh, it's extremely rare to get a sense of what dance steps were like uh, and movements, but uh, this is a, you know, I like this image because, uh, you know, you do, you do get a sense of the range of dance steps here. Uh, this is Trinidad, early 19th century. Uh, note that women often dance with a piece of cloth, uh, as we've seen in some of those previous descriptions. Note that the woman on the bottom row, uh, uh, second from the right, has a rattle in her left hand. I'm not sure you can all see that, but she does. Uh, uh, in harsh slave societies then, slaves... Uh, you know, were able to engage in this fairly, fairly rich cultural life. Uh, uh, they were able to mount frequent slave insurrections. They ran away for quite, quite often and for long periods. All of those things were more possible in such places to some extent. Um, in addition uh, to the major variation between slave societies and slave-owning societies, another variation that, that I want to mention uh, was the one that Frank Tannenbaum uh, effectively identified many years ago, and I, I list his book on, uh, it's a wonderful book, I think, still worth reading. It was written in, um, what, 1940, in, just, just during the end of the Second World War, during the Second World War. It's a short essay, easy to read, uh, but it's, um, it, I mean, he's the, really the first person to really uh, talk about the differences between uh, North American slavery uh, which was uh, much less tolerant of racial and cultural intermixture, uh, he argued, in Latin America or the Caribbean. Demography has some role to play in this difference, uh, clearly, uh, particularly the ratio of white men to white women were much more balanced in North America than it was in Latin America and the Caribbean, and that would explain why there was so, so, so much less a need for racial and cultural uh, intermixture, one could say. A shortage of white women encouraged uh, white men to take black and Indian partners uh, uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean, encouraging uh, assimilation to native ways. We saw it in the case of uh, the chocolatiers, and you could uh, you know, broaden it out to discuss, uh, in, uh, to, to, to also explain uh, cultural intermixture in a slave context. Also important, clearly, was the role of the church and cultural mores. Catholicism tended to be more inclusive than Protestantism. Furthermore, as I've mentioned before, the Iberians had mixed with Muslims for centuries. Uh, so despite the Spanish and Portuguese expulsion of Jews and Moriscos and their harsh treatment of gypsies, and despite the Inquisition's obsession with the purity of blood, the, the Iberians, unlike the English, had lived for many centuries with a kind of multiculturalism, even with the dominant presence of many black slaves. So it's not surprising, I think, that they were more tolerant of racial intermixture, more inclusive uh, culturally. So, you know, you find images uh, like this of a ceremonial dance in Brazil in the 1630s uh, that, you know, you just wouldn't find in a North American or uh, many, even in some Caribbean contexts. Here we've got men, women and children in a range of mu movements accompanied by various musical instruments uh, drums and a tambourine. It appears to be a divination a ceremony involving spirit possession. That's what's been argued. The man with the crest of feathers uh, on his head and the, women, and the woman at the center of the, paint, of the painting uh, are probably possessed by ancestral uh, spirits. The feathers indicate uh, possession by a powerful figure, perhaps a former chief or a king. Uh, 
and the man on the far left seems to be imbibing uh, what, what may be the ceremonial drink uh, from a clay jar. Or you find elaborate festivals, uh, as in this festival of Our Lady of the Rosary in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, in the late 18th century. So you again note the elaborate clothing styles of the female slaves. These are slaves. Uh, the high heel shoes, shoes with buckles, the necklaces and the other jewelry. Two of the women carry silver trays, as you can see, uh, which they sort of um, begged money from spectators, that's the idea. And they follow a small boy who's wearing colorful clothing, he's adorned by those feathers, holding a piece of wood and a, a small uh, axe. Or we have the festival of the king, again in uh, Rio uh, in the late 18th century. Uh, here we've got the coronation of a black queen. And note the, again the clothing styles of those uh, female slaves. Um, so we've got an elaborately attired uh, queen. Uh, we've got these, she's accompanied by two slave women holding up her train, uh, they, her long cape. Uh, and they've got the umbrella. Uh, you know, I said that umbrella is a constant image. You constantly see it protecting. Here it's a black person from the sun. And she's then followed by this entourage of, uh, of musicians. Uh, drum as a rasp, as a range. The English, on the other hand, as I mentioned, created a pale in their settlement of Ireland. They'd segregated themselves uh, from Native Americans in North America too. So it's not all that surprising that in North America they created the extremely arbitrary concept of Negro, denoting anyone who had allegedly visible African ancestry, and they made it carry a marked stigma uh, in a way that was um, you know, uh, certainly off the charts across the Atlantic world. Uh, it's true that the English uh, acted differently both in the Caribbean with regard to black women. Uh, we've already seen some pictures of light-scale females in many Caribbean settings. Uh, in Hudson's Bay, uh, 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 the British um, actually you know, intermarried with Native American women because white women were in short supply. So the same patterns could emerge, I think. Uh, uh, so cultural mores uh, and prior conquest history in Europe are not always the decisive factor, but they certainly had some uh, role. Uh, but generally speaking, festivities, say in the British Caribbean, are much less infused, even though they're more infused with African inflections than you'd find in North America. Even festivals in the British Caribbean are um, much less infused with African influences than you'd find, say, in Brazil, particularly some of the images I've shown you. And here we've got a John Canoe Festival in the Caribbean, these John Canoe festivals blended mumming, the English mumming tradition, with uh, African influences. You've got the rattle, you've got the drum, but the drum is, you know, looks more like a conventional European drum, and their clothing is a lot more European in style, is it, is it not? Uh, another variation uh, concerned the chances of gaining freedom, which varied greatly from one society to the next. Except for the period surrounding the American Revolution, uh, the North American colonies, later states, imposed the severest restrictions on the chances of, of a slave becoming free. Latin American societies tended to be the most accessible to manumission, and some Caribbean societies far more so than North America. Again, demography, the proportion of uh, whites and blacks in the population, certainly has some explanatory power here, as do economic and cultural forces. On your handout, I've given you some figures for the explosion the dramatic increase in freed peace persons throughout the New World just gave you some small examples. I could have broadened it out in the late 18th and early 19th century due to the revolutionary era. Um, there's, there's large increases in the, uh, in the free black uh, population. Uh, you notice the, vast, the quickest rate, the largest uh, exponential, exponential rate is in the United States um, uh, because it went from such a small number. But the great majority of the South's free blacks gained their freedom between 1780 and 1810. During that 30-year period, the population of free blacks grew at a faster rate than, 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 than did slaves. So by the very end of our period, there were large numbers of free blacks throughout the Atlantic uh, world. And I'll just show you a few images of you know, some interesting free blacks uh, uh, that you will all know. Ben, I think, or maybe not all know, but uh, Benjamin Banneker, uh, I just thought I'd, I'd uh, have a, a native Marylander for you, uh, uh, the, uh, free black in, from, from, this, uh, from this state, uh, born in 1731. Uh, here's his uh, 
famous uh, almanac that he produced in the 1790s, uh, made a first clock in 1753 when he was just 22 years of age, became proficient in astronomy, uh, served on the commission that surveyed the future district of Columbia. Um, you can go visit his, um, his site. Uh, we have a, natural, a, a, a heritage site here in Maryland that you can visit. Um, Yarrow, I'm, I'm doing a, another local, uh, Yarrow Mamut. Uh, a, um, uh, this picture image was done in 1819 uh, by Charles Wilson Peel. Um, he uh, lived in the Georgetown area near DC. Uh, he was manumitted from slavery in 1797, was a devout Muslim, uh, and uh, so you can get a sense of the, I think, of, the, of, of his uh, heritage uh, as, he's, as he's portrayed. He's, I think, the only, may be the only black person for which we have two portraits. I think I might be right about that, I'm not sure. You know, two live, I mean, there are many images of Toussaint, for example, but most of them were drawn not from life. But here is uh, Yarrow Mamut a few years later, uh, drawn by, painted by James Alexander Sim uh, Simpson. Uh, so we've got a three-year separation, but, you know, you can see clearly the same, the same person. Uh, I thought I'd show you uh, one other, Rachel Pringle. Uh, is a free black in uh, hotelier in, uh, in Barbados. This is a 1796 image. Uh, uh, you see her sitting in front of her uh, tavern, or some people might call it a different kind of institution. Um, <laughs> she was born a slave around 1753. Uh, she was a daughter of an African uh, woman and a Scottish schoolmaster, so she was uh, uh, you know, uh, of mixed ancestry. Uh, and she became a free woman of color in the 1770s and owned a hotel in Barbados. And when she died in 1792, she was said to be extremely uh, wealthy. Um, the last variation I'm going to uh, uh, touch on is um, the kind of work that slaves did and where they did it. It was clearly a very different slave experience whether one worked in temperate highlands or in tropical lowlands, on farms or on plantations, in industry or in agriculture, in shops or in fields, in skilled or in manual occupations, down mines, up trees, in the military or in civilian life, on sea or on land, in cities or in the countryside. Uh, the dominant experience was undoubtedly agricultural, manual, rural, tropical lowland, plantation heartland, tropical lowland, uh, manual. But if that's the dominant experience, there were, and we all know that, uh, to fully understand the Black Atlantic, I think, you've got to encompass some of the margins, some of the peripheries, not just the core experience of, you know, tropical lowland, plantation heartland, manual, rural, and all the rest of it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through some variations here. Uh, uh, one such kind of marginal variation, I think, is um, those staples that are not so demanding. Uh, and, you know, tobacco is clearly not a demanding, as, a, as physically demanding as sugar. Uh, you've got small gangs, you've got fairly short production cycles. Processing was minimal. So this is a famous image by Benjamin uh, Henry Latrobe. We actually have a Latrobe building on campus. Uh, or nearby campus, if you want to check that out. Uh, but uh, this is an overseer doing his duty in the, uh, in, in, in the late 18th century. And we see him just doing it, uh, supervising just two, uh, two enslaved uh, women. Uh, the, 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 port, uh, the, the kind of processing that went on in tobacco, I show you from this uh, image by William Tatham, about 1800. Uh, again, not much processing involved with tobacco. You just need a sort of small shed and uh, an area to stem and, uh, and hang the tobacco. Uh, not much capital investment involved. You could do it with a very small number. A single farmer can grow tobacco quite readily. Uh, and here's a hanging shed in the West French West Indies, French Caribbean, the same uh, phenomenon. Um, but many slaves are involved in grain farming. Here's a, here's a, here's a Perry Hall in Maryland. Uh, in uh, the early 19th century. Uh, we can see field hands at work, well dispersed across the landscape here, farming rather than planting. All we have, uh, in this image I can't get any better than this, but it's a view of Chestertown, Maryland, on the eastern uh, shore in the 1790s. Uh, we don't know who the artist is, uh, but if I do a close-up, you can see the field workers uh, 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 cutting hay, seemingly, gathering it into bundles, 
uh, while the younger, the young boy and the man in the lower right are seemingly, uh, seemingly uh, uh, putting it into, uh, assembling it into a, a haystack. Uh, that's my interpretation. Anyway, uh, we have uh, a woman with a carrying uh, some a basket on her head uh, in the Chesapeake uh, in the uh, early 19th century. Head carrying still went on then uh, in in Chestertown. Uh, and we have, if you, if you look, if you, if you look close up at the front of the image, you, you see this rather interesting scene of the white child, whip in hand, being, being uh, carried, being led, led by a slave child uh, in, you know, in a, in a toy uh, vehicle. Uh, learning the art of mastership at an early age is how I'd interpret that. Uh, or at the very left of the image, uh, we can see a slave... Uh, in a field with horses. Uh, you know, another common pattern of grain farm, mixed farming. You'd find this slaves working with livestock a great deal. And so a range of occupations there. Another, another work variation would be the sort of what would happen in a frontier economy. Uh, you know, somewhere like, I mean, there are many frontier economies in, in this period. And, uh, you know, you could say Florida would be a good example in this period. Louisiana would be a good example for the most part in the period 1500 to 1800. Uh, they never developed uh, plantation economies particularly. Uh, if you looked at, you know, um, if you looked at uh, Louisiana uh, in the 18th century, the major export was deer skins. Uh, yes, there was some tobacco and indigo being grown, but it was not competitive in the world market. So it was subsistence. It was subsistence agriculture to the degree there was any agriculture. There was no real cash crops. Um, and, you, and the slaves, as a result, are engaged in wide-ranging economic roles. Uh, transportation, manning rowboats, uh, constructing and maintaining fortifications. They're involved in the Indian trade. They're very important as soldiers in early Louisiana. Black, black, black soldiers formed 10 to 20 percent of most expeditionary forces uh, that, that the French uh, mounted in this period. One French commander even organized a separate company of about 45 uh, freemen and slaves, appointing a few of the slaves as a few of the blacks as officers. So skilled work in New Orleans uh, would involve uh, all, you know, all ranges of slaves. Slave doctors were commonplace in early Louisiana, skilled in herbal medicines. So many slaves engaged in hunting and fishing to support themselves. They were highly mo mobile. They handled fi firearms regularly. We get black herders uh, playing a prominent role in the spread of livestock production in early Louisi Louisiana, much like they did in early South Carolina. So some of the earliest cowboys in North America were black. Uh, and they enjoyed a mobility and responsibility similar to the slave hunters. Um, another marginal, I don't think it's actually very marginal, work experience, actually, but, it, but we can often call it that because we don't n normally associate blacks with it, but I think I've already tipped my hand here, uh, is the maritime world. And I think maritime slavery was extremely important in this period. Seafaring probably ranked after farming as the second largest single occupation uh, for slaves. Uh, and slaves worked in considerable numbers aboard ships and boats. Um, you know, from, uh, yes, simply, you know, rolling the hogshead, the sugar hogshead, onto the, to the boat to take it out to the ship. Um, but, you know, you're involved with maritime work to some degree in such places. Or here's English Harbor in Antigua. Or there's naval shipyards are in the back. And you can see the black boatmen in the foreground. This is a very nice image from Nicholas Pocock. There's some wonderful images of blacks in the Caribbean. It's, it's, um, it's, this is 1800. Or, um, this is going back to my, you know, that naval lieutenant I mentioned to you. He also came to the Caribbean, Gabriel Bray, and he did this, uh, this painting of English Harbor. I think it's English Harbor. And here's the, the, the practice of breaming. Uh, you burn off the pitch off the vessel. You then reapply to preserve the wood. The 1775 oil painting, uh, I count about 20 black slaves engaged in that process at work. Uh, you can't see them very well, but they're all at the bottom of that vessel there. Um, you can see black uh, boatmen, or black fishermen working on the James River. That's Benjamin Henry Latrobe again. Uh, again, another uh, picture of, uh, of uh, blacks working uh, on the rivers in Virginia uh, in this period. Uh, we've got 
Um, we've got a figure like that um, uh, on, a, a naval, on a naval vessel. This is a 1745 portrait of Captain Robert Laurie's uh, slave Tom, uh, 1745. And you know, we even find his speech being recorded uh, in this case. So we've got Hogarth's famous uh, Captain Lord Graham in his cabin, uh, middle of the 18th century. Uh, so you see the captain there, uh, uh, center, you know, to the right. Uh, well-dressed, uh, and you see the black boy in the background, black cabin boy, playing uh, a pipe and a tabor. Uh, he's a key member of the scene, uh, sort of mimicking the pose of the, of the captain, uh, Hogas, and here he is up close. You can see him with a, with a, with a, uh, uh, with a, uh, a pipe in his mouth and a tabor in his arm. Uh, we've got the interiors of midshipmen berths, and you can see uh, a black man in that image, can you not? And you can see on deck the black servant bringing uh, drinks out to a very cold deck, uh, and the black person very, sh very sparsely clothed. Uh, we can see Greenwich Hospital pensioners. Uh, se seemingly the white pensioner has made some kind of uh, joke to the black pensioner, and the black Sailor doesn't much care for it. That's my interpretation. Um, you notice, uh, if you look closely, there's an earring on the black sailor. Uh, there's a red waistcoat, uh, which is a, com a common pattern. We see a lot of red on black sailors and blacks in general in 18th, 17th and 18th century portraits. Uh, we can see Greenwich pensioners escorting Chelsea pensioners uh, around the gallery of painting at Greenwich, which you can see today. And notice him. Uh, John Demon. We know his name. He served with Nelson in the West Indies during the American Revolution. Again, note the earring and the red hat. So many slaves ran away to sea. When we think of maroons, when we think of uh, runaway slaves running to mountains and to swamps and to interiors, uh, that's all very true, but perhaps the best chance the slave had in the 18th century was to run to sea, to stay afloat, to roam around the Atlantic. Important as land-based maroons were, it's conceivable, I think, that they were outnumbered by maritime maroons. They're just lot, lot, these maritime maroons are just a lot less visible because they didn't form a stable community. So we've got all sorts of, uh, you know, of, uh, of maritime work being done by uh, slaves. The advantages of maritime slavery were the degree of worldliness, the uh, regularly voyaging between continents and cities and cultures, so the constant travel enabled them to see worlds from a variety of perspectives, exposed them to many outside influences. They were more abreast of news and politics. Seafaring slaves were the most uh, sort of assimilated of all slaves, I think, to Euro-American norms. A number of them were multilingual. The ship became for blacks in the Atlantic world what the newspaper and the Royal Mail Service were for white elites, a, a regular mode of communication then, the in in integrated uh, black communities. You get a sense of the camaraderie of, uh, of life among sailors with, uh, here we have three drunken sailors in the early 19th century. Uh, and the black sailors, clearly the most responsible, smartly dressed, and he dominates the picture. Uh, or we have, uh, we have uh, under deck uh, what's going on. A black cabin boy is learning to read uh, alongside a white cabin boy. So there's a degree of fraternization with whites. Uh, even extending to white women while, the, while their white menfolk were away, uh, seemingly. Uh, I, th I think that's what we're meant to imply there. Uh, or there's, so one advantage is simply obviously mobility, uh, world, you know, to, to be cosmopolitan, to learn something about the world. Or you could trade on the illicit market, you could smuggle, you could pilfer, you could venture, you could venture a little uh, in the cargo, in the hold to make a profit. You could carry smaller items for sale in chests and, and bunks. And then, situated on vessels, providing vital communication, it's not really surprising, I think, that black seafaring men became the leaders in the black community. So, uh, of, the, of the major autobiographies we have uh, in English before 1800, uh, the majority are, are the work of seafarers. Britton Hammond, uh, John Albert uh, Groniasaur, uh, John Marant, uh, Venture Smith, uh, Boston King, uh, and of course the most famous of all, uh, Alado Equiano. Uh, 
if indeed that is Olado Equiano. There's been some debate about that. But Olado Equiano, and we, this is definitely him because this is a painting he had drawn, he had done by, you know, by his own, he had somebody commissioned somebody to do it, uh, and, it and it's the frontispiece of his auto famous autobiography. Uh, Aquiano sailed all around the Atlantic world, for absolutely sure. He was in the Bahamas, uh, he was uh, at Fortress Louisbourg in Quebec during the Seven Years' War, he watched Mount Vesuvius erupt uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, he heard the great evangelical preacher George Whitfield in Savannah, uh, he witnessed uh, the uh, jubilant uh, celebrations of the repeal of the Stamp Act in uh, Charleston, he sailed throughout the Caribbean. He spent time on the Mosquito Coast in Central America. Uh, he even went as a seaman to the Arctic. Um, so uh, that, that's the most famous sailor of them all. But my point is that um, black leaders in the 17th and 18th centuries did not step out of the pulpit as they did in the 19th century. They stepped from behind the mast uh, for the most part. One last variation, and this is, this is where I'll end. Um, what about urban slavery? Um, only a minority of slaves lived in towns and cities, but those who did experienced a distinctive form of life. Uh, you could often hire yourself out, uh, for example, in a town. So there were two ways to rent out your services as a slave in the 18th century. Sometimes the master was responsible for the hire arrangement. Uh, but in other respects, in other, in other places, the slave had permission to market his or her services. And this second way was almost exclusively urban. Self-hire made sense where the slave offered a specialized service and was in constant demand. So the slave who hired, uh, their own, those slaves who hired their own time had a considerable measure of independence, surely. Required by masters to pay a certain sum of money, either weekly or monthly, the slave could save or freely spend whatever he or she earned above the stipulated amount. So slaves who hired their own time offered a kind of, you know, lived, lived in a kind of twilight zone between bondage and freedom. They got to handle money. They made their own purchases. They often lived in rented dwellings beyond the purview of whites. The urban environment also had a relaxing effect upon the social as well as economic life of slaves. Urban slaves were more mobile, less restricted, had higher levels of literacy. They had more opportunity for adventure and initiative than their rural, rural counterparts. They could organize and form institutions, schools, churches far more readily. There were constant complaints by white townsmen of their slaves' extravagant and costly clothing, their access to alcohol, their gambling. The town was a magnet for runaway slaves. The chances of being freed were much greater in town than in the countryside. Free people congregated in towns too. And markets, urban markets, offered uh, opportunities for slave women to hawk their products and earn money. And this is my last series of images. Here is a Barbadian market woman, well-dressed, carrying a basket and what appears to be a letter uh, this is, uh, this is uh, 1802. Uh, we have more Barbadian market women, uh, one with a water vessel in, 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 in arm. Uh, we have uh, enslaved uh, uh, market women in, uh, in Rio de Janeiro, late 18th century. I'm going to show a quick number of these, all sorts of variations of what they're carrying, what they're holding, well worth exploring in detail. Fish on head, trays with fruit on head, um, large bundle of grass on head, water vessels. Uh, see the range of head carrying, another Brazilian scene. Um, this is William Berryman who visited Jamaica uh, for eight years in the early 19th century and did these very interesting, I think, small drawings of head carrying, often of market vendors uh, carrying a range of goods. Um, We've got pottery sellers in uh, Kingston, Jamaica. Uh, we have milkmaids and, and suppliers in Suriname. I thought my last image should be Baltimore. Um, this is, this is um, Fremont Avenue, Baltimore, 1822. A slave engaged in head portrage, head carrying um, on the streets of this Chesapeake uh, town. So, uh, 
I hope what I've tried to do today is um, present a kaleidoscope to you. We've ranged from some core experiences, the experience of slavery itself, of course, sugar plantations, life on the African coast. But we showed that even within those three realms, there was a good deal of, uh, of, of significant variation. The middle passage, as I pointed out, was not a uniform experience at all. It depended a great deal on what part of the African coast you came from, the kind of experience you would have on board ship. Uh, once outside Africa, as I've suggested, the variations only grew more numerous between areas where slaves uh, reproduced naturally and those that did, where they were dependent on immigration, between true slave societies and those societies with only some slaves, between North America and Latin America and the Caribbean, in differing access to freedom, and perhaps most fundamentally according to the kind of work in which slaves were engaged. And I looked at a number of variations there. So there were core experiences and there were margins. The margins, I would argue, were valuable safety valves to the core system of plantation slavery. Slaves from the plantation heartland could take off for frontier regions. They could get transferred to farms. They could go to sea or they could visit towns. If the plantation was slavery's dynamo, the margins were, the, were slavery's thermostat, uh, providing some release for the internal pressures generated by that system of plantation slavery. The bottom line here is that there was much variation in the black Atlantic. Slavery was not a uniform institution. It was infinitely variable, flexible, and dynamic. There was not one black Atlantic. There were many. Thanks. will say this is indeed the image of hell. And you get a sense, I think, from this uh, Caribbean depiction of the nightmarish quality of uh, working uh, at night in a boiling house with slaves hauling cane trash uh, to the fuel furnace. But not all sugar plantations were of a piece. Most Brazilian sugar, pl sugar planters, for example, at least posed as patriarchs. This is something uh, you remember David Brian Davis talks about whereas many Caribbean planters made little effort to conceal that they were entrepreneurs whose goal in life was to make money, uh, not to become resident seigneurs. So a good many West Indian sugar planters were absentees, whether back in France or Britain or the Netherlands. They tended to see themselves as engaged in a purely capitalistic enterprise, not a quasi seigneurial community, as did many Brazilian planters, who adopted something of the style of feudal lords, and you get a sense of that, I think, from this, uh, this Brazilian scene. It's um, about 1640. Uh, you see the manor house in the background. You see the plantation buildings. You see the vertical, uh, sugar, uh, ro uh, vertical roller sugar mill. And in the center of the scene, you see the planter riding on his horse uh, uh, ahead of his, uh, I think it must be probably his wife or his concubine, who's being transported in a hammock. So we have these traditions of uh, paternalistic patronage uh, that, you know, that existed amongst the Brazilian slaveholders. doesn't mean that they were kinder uh, and gentler than their more capitalistic slaveholders in the Caribbean, but their exploitation did occur, I think, in the context of you know, where they use metaphors of family, obligation, and clientage. And there's a different sort of quality, I think, to the style of life uh, between sugar plantation life in Brazil and that in the Caribbean. So if you turn to Caribbean scenes, and uh, you know, I know I've shown this one before, of cane holing, you don't see a white person in sight. Uh, this is um, a black driver uh, running the show. Uh, similarly, uh, another scene of uh, planting cane uh, uh, in, uh, in Antigua. Again, uh, no white person in, pre in, in, in evidence. Um, uh, here's, a, here's, here's a group cutting uh, cane. Note the prominence of women uh, in this grueling task on a sugar plantation, something I emphasized. Um, here we actually do see, I think, uh, no we don't because it's off image, but there is actually an overseer there, but again you see a black driver uh, running the show. You see the women stacking the cane uh, uh, on, you know, in, the, in the foreground and you see them carrying the cane on their heads into the mill. So even a core experience such as the sugar plantation has variations, is my point. A third core experience was just living along the Atlantic 
African coast or its adjoining hinterlands. Quite how many people that involved is extremely hard to say, but maybe approximately 25 million people or more lived on the Atlantic African coast. So if you're looking for the majority black experience in the Atlantic, it would be there, wouldn't it? Some of these Africans were active and voluntary participants in the Atlantic world, even though the Atlantic coast of tropical Africa had been more isolated than regions closer to the Sahara or along the Indian Ocean until the arrival of the Portuguese, West African societies had developed marketing networks, professional merchants, systems of transport and currencies through participation in local and regional trade. So, in a sense, the transatlantic slave trade uh, could simply uh, you know, uh, impose itself on an already existing well-developed market structure. And here we see captive Africans whipped and guarded by other Africans, their, their captors. Uh, this is a, a, an 18th century image from, the, uh, from the, uh, the Gold Coast. Here is, a cap here is the capture and coffle of an enslaved Africans in Angola in the 1780s. You see that some of the traders have guns. Uh, some of the coffles are more restrained uh, than others. Some are, uh, you know, cl clearly you, you always restrain the men. This is an image uh, dr uh, that a slave ship captain um, uh, uh, did in, in, in Sierra Leone in the 17, uh, early 1790s. You see Fulani guards armed with bows, arrows, and spears escorting a coffle that uh, had, he, he said in his journal, 50 people or more. African rulers and merchants control much of the nature of interactions with Europeans. Some of them allowed Europeans to set up forts and factories uh, on sufferance along the coast. There, the Europeans paid rent and tribute and taxes to African landlords. This was most evident along the Gold Coast, uh, where there were few accessible rivers and there was strong surf. So here's a picture of Elmina Castle on the Gold Coast. I know some of you have been there. This is a 1640 image of what it was like. Uh, it clearly quite changes quite a bit over time. Um, Christiansborg Castle uh, also. Uh, um, so my theme today is um, that of a kaleidoscope, something that's constantly changing. Uh, and I have two meanings in mind um, when I talk about the uh, Black Atlantic as a kaleidoscope. First, the Black Atlantic was not uniform. Uh, the black experience in this vast space was hardly the same. It was not a one piece. Uh, there were enormous variations throughout the, uh, the Atlantic world. So rather than one, there were many black Atlantics. So in a sense, my title is somewhat m mistitled. Um, so I want to reveal then in this, in this, in this talk um, something of the many differences, the constant variations. Uh, it's also kaleidoscopic because I'm going to show you, as I mentioned, an array of images of the black experience to indicate that it's possible to reveal graphically uh, significant aspects of black life. Many, though not all, of these images come from the, uh, from the Atlantic slave trade and slave life in the Americas website, um, so you can easily put together your own version of what I'm about to show you to some degree. But I've also added a lot that I've accumulated over the years myself. Um, so, while I'm committed to showing you variations then and constant changes, there was obviously some core experiences in the Black Atlantic. Those blacks who were slaves shared an, an, an enviable status because slaves, uh, slavery always meant uh, selling human beings as alienable property. But to be a slave in Africa uh, was a very different matter, as we know, from being a slave in the Americas. In most places in Africa, at least in the 16th and 17th centuries, uh, slavery was a marginal institution, a minor, inst a mi a minor uh, feature of the social landscape. Many a slave was able to pass over time uh, from an alien member to a, to a kin member. In large part because Africa was underpopulated, there was a broad spectrum of dependent statuses in Africa, with slavery just one variant of a whole array of, of uh, statuses from clientage, pawnage, and so on. Uh, and slaves played a wide range of roles in Africa, from field workers to uh, soldiers, uh, from domestics, uh, even to high-level bureaucrats and administrators. Uh, and I'm going to show you a picture here of a, uh, a well-armed African uh, this is a very early 17th century portrait of a, of a black man from Angola. Or the, uh, I could show you, uh, here we go, sorry. Uh, 
this uh, Gold Coast African, a free ranger, uh, so-called, in Suriname in the late 18th century, uh, obviously well-armed, but in this case uh, with a musket. Another core experience uh, was the sugar plantation uh, that we talked about yesterday that drew so many Africans um, to, to the New World. There was a measure of uniformity to, being, to, be, to living on a sugar plantation, so no matter where it was located, uh, as early as the 1630s, a visitor to a Jesuit-owned sugar plantation in Brazil vividly described the undeniable horror of what had transpired. And this is what he said, people the color of the very night, working briskly and moaning at the same time without a moment of peace or rest. Whoever sees all the confused and noisy machinery and apparatus of this Babylon, even if they have seen Mount Etna and Vesuvius,